still uh, share the answers with you um, before you guys leave here. So I've got 13 questions. Do the best you can on them, and I will share the answers with you. If you're aware of anybody who couldn't make the session today, uh, obviously plenty of resources. Uh, A109 is my homeroom. First come, first serve. Uh, I made 50 copies. You do the subtraction. If you grab one for somebody, that's fine. Uh, but just send them my way. Um, and if I have time before next Friday, I could always run off another set. Well, and Mr. Morgan, if you have a hard copy, you can just email it to me, and I can upload it to the website. Perfect. I can do it. And Perfect. Alex is doing um, some stuff with Google Docs as well. Um, Perfect. And he's got things up there. That's great. Yeah, let's definitely utilize the resources and the technology. Yeah, just to review what I, I gave out today, the 13 multiple choice questions that cover what I've been asked to cover today, uh, the years of the Civil War, and Reconstruction. So to my knowledge, Mr. Upplinger took you through the election of 1860, so I'm going to pick up right from there, take you through the Civil War. Now clearly, we do not have the time to cover four years of Civil War and the entire complex nature of the conflict. So that's why I put together this handout, which covers the major battles and the major events. And, and this is something that you should all know by this point in time through Ms. Quinn and myself, or especially my students. Um, battles, uh, the, the only ones you would possibly have to know would be major turning points because they have shifted dramatically away um, from battle. So here you would have to know Gettysburg, for Absolutely. instance. Absolutely. And uh, Gettysburg is on there to reinforce what Mr. Nash just said. Uh, bull run I opened up with uh, Shiloh, Antietam, Gettysburg. That's it. Uh, peninsular campaign, things of that nature. All right. uh, nearly a thousand engagements between Union and Confederate forces during the war that span from obviously New Jersey, all right, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Texas, California, for goodness sake. Emancipation and on the back. It's not just battles, but it's also key turning points, social, political, economic. Questions there? Okay. And lastly, top 10 events from major eras that whether Mr. Upplinger, uh, Ms. Shaw, uh, myself, uh, Mr. Nash, Ms. Quinn have taken you through. Uh, again, this is a, not a comprehensive list. It was put together by a colleague down in Virginia at an AP conference, and she recognized these as being turning points. And there's everything in here from political, social, and even the literary movements from the transcendentalist era or the era of reform and so forth. So these are the top tens. Uh, Cold War, Colonial America, Spanish-American War, Progressive Era, et cetera, et cetera. Good to familiarize yourself, and it does give a small little blurb uh, about, the, about the time, about the event. And, and Mr. Morgan, yeah. while you're on that, um, I know we're a week away, folks. If you do see anything on Turning Point, the explanation would be, well, how is it different before and after? Mm -hmm. That means there have been dramatic shifts or changes, and you would have to be able to explain those as why an event is or is not a turning point. You absolutely could see those questions in short answer uh, and have to defend your position on that one as well. And what's nice about I did I did my best to put it in like a chronological order, and there's also a thematic order as well. So that you know they like to see what came before, you know, what's during the question, and then obviously, you know, what, what comes after. It's a comprehensive understanding of the topic at hand. Yeah, not just you know about the question itself, but you know what came before, and you know what briefly comes after. You know what briefly comes after. So why don't we start? So with the election of 1860, uh, that's where Mr. Upplinger left off. Uh, we've got a, a major election. Uh, we've got four candidates in this particular election. Uh, we know the outcome, and so we're going to set the scene leading up to that election. We call this antebellum America, the decades leading up to the Civil War. Recognize the fundamental changes that are going to take place in American society between these decades. All right, antebellum era. Fundamental changes. Now, obviously, antebellum refers to pre-Civil War, but it's going to take you up to the 1870s. Social changes, political changes, economic changes during this time period. We know our social, we know our political, we know our economic. Fundamental changes. What do we have going on here? Just food for thought. What are some of the changes, 1840s to the 1870s? What's going on? 
Amendment. All right, so we're jumping into the 1860s, late 1860s. We have those transformative constitutional amendments of 13 through what? 15. 16 comes later. All right, that's progressive era. Go ahead. When would that last with the gold rush? Absolutely. You've got manifest destiny taking place, and what question needs to be answered? Yeah, it's great moving west. It's great taking on that land, one from the Mexican-American War and the Mexican Session, but what question we tried to answer in 1820, but then that really didn't work out. What? Could slavery be <laughs> exactly, the slavery question. Very good. What other changes are taking place during this time period, whether social, political, or economic? Annex Texas. The annexation of Texas. Keep in mind that Texas question comes up 1830s with Jackson, Van Buren, and Tyler. They don't touch it for what reason? They don't touch the Texas issue. Even though people are crying, let's annex it, let's add Texans, go. They want re-election. They want re-election, true, but what's, what's at stake? Because of that line that's drawn in 1820, Texas will ultimately come in as a? a slaveholding state. So again, just understand that this issue of slavery is going to be hovering over this antebellum era. Let's move on. It's considered a second revolution by some historians. Some historians refer to this time period as like a second revolution, that there's dramatic change going on. We're missing a big one, particularly for my students that I had last year, with the emphasis that we try to place on that last check mark. What's going on? What are we going through? What are we going through in this time period? It's going to usher in an era of reform, and it's going to be heavily reliant on slave labor in the South. What? True, but in the grand scheme of things, we have what? We have industrialization, we have industrial revolution. And so that's going to even open up even more questions. And so there's a great revolution, some consider the second revolution. And lastly, again, this is the setting of the scene. I know Mr. Nash likes to use that expression, we like to use that set the scene. What's leading up to this time period that I'm going to speak to you about today over the next 50 minutes or so? The union in peril. Mr. Rupplinger addressed this in the last session. You've got social, you've got political, you've got economic. The 1850s, we are ripping the country apart. And it's going to come across literary movements as well. The abolitionist movement is going to gain more steam and more strength. We have to answer questions about slave states and free states. And what branch of government finally throws their hat in the ring in 1857? Decades, they kind of let Congress and let presidents talk about slavery, but finally they come to the ball. The uh, judicial branch. The judicial branch decision. with the Dred Scott decision. All right, with the Dred Scott decision. So certainly a lot of implications. Let's get closer, all right, to what Mr. Upplinger left off with last time. The election of 1860. You tell me, candidates and results. Candidates and results. What do we have leading up? And I would actually uh, reference the 270 to win website. We've used that in my class. Those of you who had me in class, 270 to win. Familiarity with some of the electoral college results from those transformative elections. And I'd say that this was certainly transformative. Go. Lincoln is a Republican and he has a free soil platform. Which was what? Free soil platform. The non-extension of slavery. The non-extension of slavery. Not to touch it yet where it currently existed, but that we are not going to let it expand into the territories. Who else was in this election? 60. We all know Lincoln. Yeah. Who's the popular sovereignty champion? Let the people decide what they want to do with slavery out there. We're not going to legislate slavery from Washington, D.C. Let the people decide. Okay. Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas. Who else do we have? Not uh, Buchanan. Buchanan is the previous. Yeah, yeah. Buchanan's having some difficulties. All right, he he's out. All right, he's going to be that lame duck. All right, that lame duck president. We've got Breckinridge and John C. Bell. Right, the Constitutional Union Party. All right, the Constitutional Union Party. Be familiar with the candidates. All right, and their positions on slavery. Most notably, what party splits over the issue of slavery? Democrat split. You have a northern Democrat and you have a southern Democrat. So slavery divides the party. All right, and Mr. Morgan, just to pause right on that, uh, when you start making connections, and we talked about this getting ready for uh, the essays, 
um, from one time period to another, uh, you can absolutely make some connections where we have split tickets before. There you go. Um, who, can, who can give Mr. Morgan some of them? Um, go ahead, Budokan. Uh, 1912, uh, 1912 election. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 1912. Absolutely. Who was it? And who was the who was, uh, who was the who was, who was the, the candidate party? who's uh, the big third party candidate? Roosevelt. Roosevelt. And then who was our favorite socialist of all time? Debs. Debs. Yes, we have Wilson becoming a minority president. Mm -hmm. We have more as well um, that we can move forward with. Yeah. Oh, wait, what party did you say John C. Bell was from? Constitutional Union Party. From Tennessee, I believe it was Tennessee. He wins Tennessee. Ironically enough, Stephen Douglas is the most probably notable name coming into this election. I think he just wins Missouri. And he splits New Jersey's votes with Lincoln. You look at the Electoral College map, make a note of it. Look at the Electoral College map of the election of 1860, and you see clearly defined lines of sectionalism. Remember, at this time, loyalty to one state took precedence as far as loyalty to the nation as a whole. You were a Georgian before you were an American. You were a Virginian before you were an American. So when the Lower South secedes, we're going to get into that today. You know, the Upper South pretty much follows suit. Go ahead. Uh, what was Douglas's platform? Douglas's platform was popular sovereignty. Who could remind us? I mentioned it briefly. Popular sovereignty meant what? Go ahead. Like when the people would vote on whether slavery would be instituted. Exactly. Rather than legislating because of your geography, where you fall, north or south, as you moved west, we had to carve states out of that territory that we won from Mexico. <laughs> the citizens would decide. Call it a referendum. The citizens and the individual state legislators, they would decide whether or not. Washington is not going to legislate slavery anymore. It wasn't working for the first 70 years of our nation's history. It's certainly not going to help moving forward as we expanded with Manifest Destiny. The aftermath of the election. So this is me. All right? That was all Uplinger leading up to candidates and party platforms. Lincoln wins. What's the irony of that? How is a Lincoln victory extremely ironic? He was not on most of the ballots in the Deep South. That didn't matter, right? Why? Why didn't it matter? The fact that Lincoln, you couldn't vote for him in Georgia or Virginia, even if you wanted to. It didn't matter why. Because the North held more electoral. Yeah, all of the population was concentrated in the North. And if you look at the Electoral College map from the election of 1860, you'll see a bunch of, all right, red, all right, representing victory by Abraham Lincoln in those northern states. He carried the North, all right, because of his position as a former free soiler by not letting slavery expand westward. So now we have aftermath. At what time did, or at what point, or in what month did presidential inaugurations take place back then? So that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Go ahead. March. March. Not like January today. So the election happens in November, December, January, February, March. Finally, Lincoln has some authority being inaugurated. James Buchanan is sitting back idle. What was his position? Because what starts to happen in December, and January, and February, and March in the South? What starts to happen? My fan's up in the top. Yeah, what starts to happen? Go, Go ahead. Right. Here we go. Southern National, oh no, okay, we knew this was happening, and we made good on our pledge. If Lincoln was elected, we're out of here. Starting with who? South December, I believe it was uh, December 20th, South Carolina. No surprise that Fort Sumter is located <laughs> off the coast of South Carolina. No surprise. Tell me about South Carolina in the 1820s and the 1830s. Why is this no surprise that South Carolina is the first one to dip? Go. They're heavily relying on slaves. Right? But keep in mind also, by the time we get to the 1820s, 1830s, right, along the coast, these have exhausted all of the land, and so now with cotton. So now you've got to find more land to plant cotton. And so that's how slavery continues to expand. Slave trade is abolished. You cannot legally import slaves, but I'm sure smuggling still took place. And so now, you have this idea of just procreating, right, for as far as slavery is concerned. Why out South Carolina? What do they have major issues with in the 1820s? 
no surprise that in December after Lincoln, they're out. They were ready. Go. Tariff. Tariff issues. Nullification, tariffs, states' rights. You're not going to do this. Yet Washington, D.C. is not going to legislate stuff in South Carolina. Now we've got this Lincoln character, and we know how he feels about slavery. Our southern institution is threatened. Our southern institution is threatened by a Lincoln presidency. So between December and February, December of 1860 and February of 1861, seven states secede from the Union. And those are the lower south. The lower south. They border the Gulf of Mexico, right, and they border, obviously, the Atlantic with Georgia and Florida and South Carolina as well. Between April and June, so the one bookend is South Carolina here and Texas, right? So South Carolina to Texas, lower southern states to see. Uh, between April and June, you've got what? Four more. The upper south. The upper south secedes. So you've got Virginia. You've got, help me, Tennessee, uh, no, not Tennessee, uh, Tennessee. You've got North Carolina, and what else? Good. Yeah. Georgia. And Georgia. All right. Uh, well, Georgia's lower south. I'm throwing upper south. Four or four. Be careful about those border states. North Carolina, Tennessee, Maryland. Maryland. All right. No, Maryland is a border state. Maryland border state. Would somebody find the four other states that seceded from the Union, please? Missouri, Arkansas, Arkansas. Missouri, Arkansas. Arkansas. Missouri's a border state. Missouri's a border state. All right. Forgot about, forgot about Arkansas. Yeah, my apologies <laughs> to anybody who's from Little Rock. All right. All right. They'll compromise. Buchanan's a lame duck. He believed he didn't have the constitutional authority to prevent state secession. And even as early as December, as he's watching South Carolina leave and knowing the fact that other states are going to follow suit because the southern institution of slavery is threatened by a Lincoln presidency. You have a lame duck Buchanan. Define a lame duck presidency for me, please. The lame duck presidency. It's the last couple months of their term, so they don't really pass any legislation or do anything. Exactly. It's the waiting game. Right? It's certainly the waiting game. You can just think of Lincoln at this time. Just, just get me in the office, right? Get me in the office, and let me try to do something about it. Well, he does. This point on federal property. As far as federal property was concerned, as the southern states seceded and they had federal property in their jurisdiction, if you want to call it, they seized it. And it fell under Confederate control. So this is U.S. federal property now being seized by Confederate governments in the South. Now keep in mind what they're doing here. The Confederate States of America is doing what? Do they have a president? Yeah. Who? Davis. Yeah, Jefferson Davis, absolutely. All right. Do they have a constitution? Yeah. Absolutely. Very much mirrors that of the Constitution of the North, but it does what specifically? It, it, it recognizes in print all right, the institution of slavery. So federal property, all right, we have to address this issue. Compromise is still an option. Right? Compromise is still an option. Wait, 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 wait. Let's see if we can settle this thing. How about we go back to the terms of the Missouri Compromise? What were the terms of the Missouri Compromise? Compromise of 1820 error of good feelings, post-war of 1812, nationalism. Go ahead. 36, 39, anything above would be free, anything south would be slave. With the exception of? Missouri. With the exception of Missouri, right, all those states falling above or north of 36 degrees, right, 30 minutes, right, that's how it's read, 36 degrees, 30 minutes, right, would be a, north of that line, would be a slave, uh, the free state, with the exception of Missouri. They balance that with what? What other state? Missouri comes in slave, so you can't throw off the balance in the Senate. You got to have equality here. Go. Maine. All right. Maine was once formerly part of Massachusetts. Right. Maine comes into the Union as a free state. Note what they tried to do for the first 70 years. Compromise over slavery. Compromise. Three-fifths compromise, right? The Constitutional Convention for apportioning population, you know, the, slave, uh, the state slave population. Then you've got the Missouri Compromise. You've got all these compromises. 
No generation wanted to address it. What did it take? What does it take? It takes this. And Jefferson predicted it. That's early. When he found out about the Missouri Compromise, slavery will rip this country apart like a tornado. Jefferson, the founding fathers just had a vision. They could just see, they could discern things. That this is not good. You're doing the, a tit for tat. Free slave, free slave, free slave. And he's going to you got to keep that equality and keep that balance. Why is this not a possibility? Why is this not a possibility? For Republicans to support this, it's going to do what? So for Republicans to do this, to say, all right, you know what? Let's stop this secession thing. Let's just, all right, all right, guys. Let's just go back to the Compromise of 1820. We'll, we'll do that. All right, we'll get, we'll, we'll, the, the whole Kansas, Nebraska, all right, we'll just redo all that. We're just going to go back to the terms of the compromise. Why could they not do that? It's against the Fifth Amendment. Yeah. Well, that was Fifth Amendment, as well as what? It's against their own party what? It's, their it's, it's against their own party platform, right? They've got to kind of go back, right, on their party platform, all right? Good stuff. Good stuff. Fort Sumter. <clears throat> Again, I'm giving you the skeleton here. I'm giving you the skeleton here of this era. I'm going to try to plug in all right, some areas. Go ahead. What, what was the Crittenden? The Crittenden Compromise was this. Let's just go back to the terms of the Missouri Compromise. Forgive me. That's, that's the connection. All right? Senator Crittenden of Kentucky. All right? said, why don't we just go back to the terms of the Missouri Compromise? We'll settle this thing. Let's just go back to the way it was. Well, it didn't change it. That's what got us here in the first place. And had they addressed the issue in Philadelphia in 1787, Maybe things would be a little bit different. Right. Can you cut the joke for a second? Can I do oh, what? Yeah, anyway. mm -hmm. I said to cut the film. Forgive me. My battery went. Why not? I'll, get, I'll need a second to just shut down and reboot. <laughs> Tanner, why don't you provide some entertainment for us in between? <laughs> I'll just go on Fort Sumter. All right, I'll just go on Fort Sumter. Um, let me log in first so I can do the welcome screen, and then I'll pick up at Fort Sumter. My apologies. <coughs> Anyone know some jokes? Confederate States of America's right to exist. So it's going to be business as usual. So upon learning of the attack on Fort Sumter, and even the weeks leading up, Lincoln's going to reinforce the fort with supplies, with food, with weapons, possibly anticipating an attack. The South perceives this as Lincoln essentially preparing for a conflict. So maybe Lincoln is viewed as the what? He's viewed as the antagonist, he's viewed as the aggressor. <laughs> to make matters worse, after the attack on Fort Sumter, of which ultimately Major Anderson is forced to abandon the fort, Lincoln's response, he calls up volunteers to form one army. Now, this is not helping because, again, we can't look at all these events as, okay, this happens. Then this happens, then this happens. States are seceding, states are against Lincoln, Lincoln's now in office. So these are like layers to an onion here. And we're just peeling back all these different layers. And if you know how to peel an onion, 
Uh, they they don't always make, all those peels don't come off nicely. You almost pull a peel off with it, uh, another peel off with it together. So now we want to take some time to look at the strategic resource comparison. Now that we know right, that war has been declared, the South is being perceived as an aggressor by attacking federal property, Lincoln calling up 70,000 volunteers to fight in all these names, the War for Southern Independence, the War of Northern Aggression, the U.S. Civil War, all these different names that are tagged along with the U.S. Civil War. Let's compare and contrast. Who has the advantages? So let's, let's look at an issue. Let's look at an area and say, all right, definitely Southern advantage. Uh, there was a Northern advantage. So why don't we look at, let's start with population. So who has the larger pool of resources as far as human capital, human resources, to fight in this war because a draft is instituted? Both sides will utilize conscription. Go ahead. The North. The North. Clear. All right. I mean, pretty much the election of 1860 showed you that. Now, granted, all right, four million slaves in the South at the height of the Civil War were not able to participate in the franchise and vote and things of that nature, nor were they utilized in a combat role. So right there, you can see a strategic disadvantage to the South. They have a labor force that they are not going to equip with weapons for fear of what? Rebellion. For fear of rebellion. So it's logistics, right? It's moving cannons, it's transporting supplies. That's the primary role that slaves will play, you know, for the Confederacy, up until the end, when they get really desperate, right? Until they get, to, until they get really desperate there in 1865. Give me another area. <coughs> what about, uh, if we look at population, what about the economy? What about the economy? This is going to be, hint, hint, wink, wink, this is going to be huge. This is Lincoln's war weapon. He weaponizes the northern economy. Let's see how. Go ahead. Uh, northern industry? Northern industry. All right. Turning out, you name it, everything. All right. Bullets, guns, cannons, ships. Ironclads, you name it, all right? The Northern Industrial Powerhouse. What else? During the time period of industrialization, what are we building in the North? There's very few of it in the South, and Lincoln weaponizes it. Go. Railroads. Railroads. Right, the Iron Horse, right? Do not ignore the impact of transportation as a strategic resource for the North during the Civil War. Absolutely, 100%. What else? This is a big one. Uh, I'll give you a hint. While they were building the railroads, they said, oh, why don't we lay these along the railroad lines? Since we're laying the railroads and we're here anyway, why don't we lay these too? Okay. Telegraph lines. Lincoln's ability to communicate with his commanders and his generals by a little tap, 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 and a hold, right? By sending that telegraph code across the battlefield. Certainly a strategic advantage for Abraham Lincoln. Railroads, roads, telegraph. What else? What else can we look at as far as you know, who's got the advantage coming in? Right? What about where, the, where it's being fought? Where is this conflict being fought? Where's it being fought? The South. It's being fought predominantly in the South. Advantage who? South. Advantage South, certainly. And it's just like that same strategic advantage that the colonists had over the mighty British Empire. Knowing the land, knowing the terrain, having a very supportive local community uh, as you have kind of like what? The North coming down, right? Invading, right? They have to come to us. <coughs> there was an exception. When did Lee go to them? For pretty much the whole war, it's the yeah, North right. going down there and fighting different campaigns and Sherman cutting a path of destruction, all right? And his march to the sea and Savannah and Atlanta are just kind of gutted. What is it? Okay. It's Gettysburg. All right. Desperate yeah. for supplies. All right. Really desperate. Yeah. No advantage, no goal of the Confederacy to move north. All right. To move north and take over the territory. They were concerned about their livelihood moving west and enduring. All right. So that's a good resource comparison. Right. Strategic resource comparison. Uh, just certainly note because of industrialization. And the South, heavily relying on an agricultural way of life. Now, here's a good one for you. The South had the potential of 
what tremendous advantage. It didn't work out. It didn't work out because that potential advantage had a conscience. Got it? I lost it. You lost it. That's okay. Aid from Europe, aid predominantly from Great Britain. But many European nations, as you know by this time, had already emancipated slaves. Right? They are no longer right, holding slaves. It's the United States that's still right, the slave holder right, in the world, as well as other areas. Why would Britain want to? They didn't, but how could this have happened? Go ahead. Uh, because they faced um, industrial competition from the north and the sure. South was their primary trade. Correct. Right. The South's <laughs> largest trading partner of cotton right, is going to be Great Britain. But then, it's like I said, Britain gets a conscience. Right? They can't recognize a slave-holding nation, the Confederate States of America, that they saw themselves as. So they find resources of cotton in Egypt and India. Right? So they pretty much they find their cotton elsewhere. Right? The sun never sat still pretty much at that time as well on the, on the British Empire. They still had colonial holdings. Uh, in Africa and in uh, South Asia. Uh, the war strategy, uh, the engagements, see the handout. I'm not going to take time uh, to go over all the major engagements and so forth. Okay? Uh, but we know this is a war that claims hundreds of thousands of lives on both sides. Uh, it divides the nation, clearly. It divides parties, clearly. It divides families, for goodness sake. So you may want to kind of brush up on some of the social consequences uh, of the war. You cannot ignore the four million slaves held in bondage right, during this conflict as well. And try to answer the question, okay, what happens next? What happens after this war? When this war ends? Just one quick comparison here or statement. Both sides anticipate a short war. In any major conflict, both sides are going to anticipate a short conflict. But the reason why I put the first battle, Bull Run, it results in a what victory? Who? It's a Confederate victory. It's a Confederate victory. And that's going to say, okay, maybe this war is going to be a little bit longer than what we bargained for. War strategy. Yeah, I'm going to skip over this, but come back to war strategy. Uh, what you're going to see here is some irony. A lot of the men who fought at, uh, alongside each other during the Mexican-American War are going to fight against each other during the Civil War. So young lieutenants, young, com young commanders, uh, young generals, they're going to fight against young infantrymen. They're going to be fighting together in Mexico right, during the Mexican-American War, but then be fighting against each other during the Civil War. So note that parallel. One of those individuals was a man named Winfield Scott. And he's going to devise a war strategy to fulfill the objective of winning this war. What was it called? The anaconda plan. An anaconda, all right, is a snake. It's a very big snake. How does it kill its prey? Strength. Strength. Yeah. Squeezes it. There is a political cartoon. Note it. I think it's been used in the past on the exams, all right? The anaconda cartoon. All right, General Winfield Scott. It's got a three-prong offensive here. What's the objectives? Anaconda plan. Three parts to it. Go ahead. Okay, first and foremost, for foremost, naval blockade. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Check. Done. The second one. Some people oftentimes forget this one. They know the third one, because that's like game, set, match. Done. What's the second part? Good. Divide the South over the Mississippi. Very good. Divide the Confederacy in two by controlling the Mississippi River. Done. Check. Mm -hmm. The third part of the Anaconda plan, and again, this is not going to take a place over a matter of weeks. It's going to take place over a matter of years. Moving on Richmond. Moving on Richmond. Which they do. That famous story of Lincoln actually sitting in Jefferson Davis's chair. I mean, how much better could that get? All right? The president self-proclaimed elected president of the Confederacy. I am sitting in his chair right now. And it was only a matter of a couple days all right, uh, before uh, the, the surrender takes place at Appomattox Courthouse, and then what, 25 days later, right, the assassination of Lincoln. Right, so there you have your major engagements. Uh, 
That's where I kind of stop there with the actual war itself. And again, that handout is really going to help with some of the engagements. Now, for the uh, duration of the 20 minutes or so that I have remaining, it's a nice little balance. Let's go into reconstruction. Right? So let's kind of put the union back together. Right? Let's put the union back together. All right, so I'm just going to throw this all up here at once. Right. End of the bloody war and reconstruction. I uh, do my best to get us all the way up to the Compromise of 1877. Again, panoramic view here, right? very much a panoramic view uh, for the sake of time and also for, you know, not to impede on your own preparation of how you study for this exam. I'm going to give you the skeleton here, and you're going to have to place everything else. Right? You're going to have to place everything else. All right, so we had the war being fought between 1861 and 1865. What's Lincoln's attitude? even while the war is being fought. The war is being fought, people are dying, states have seceded, he's trying to put this mess off. What's his viewpoint? What's his attitude? What's his emotion? Go ahead. Uh, kindness towards the South. Kindness to the South. Kindness. Uh, um, he is very lenient, right? He wants to what? What's, what's Lincoln's objective? What's his objective? Restore the Union. Restoration of the Union. And that was essentially a big part of his campaign. You know, restore the Union. However that looks, I want to restore the Union. So between those four years, with the war being fought and the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, during the war itself, Lincoln is already making plans for Reconstruction. Now, as you prepare, you're going to see Reconstruction. You're going to see Restoration. You're going to see presidential reconstruction. You're going to see radical Republicans, and there's going to be all these different plans. And how do we make sense of it? Ultimately, states will end up coming back to the Union, in some cases, on different plans. Then you have these long holdouts that they hold out way to the end, like Texas or something to that effect. Right? But there were some states, like Tennessee. There were some states, like Louisiana. Get me back in. We're in. We're back. Because the longer they waited, what was the risk? The longer you waited to rejoin the Union, all right, what was the risk? Go ahead. The longer it would take to re-elect new officials. To Correct. All right, so it's going to extend the process, and the hoops may become more difficult to jump through. Oh, you want to come back now? you got to do this, 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 and this. You come back earlier, there's not so much of a to-do list to come back. Now, obviously, between these years, and again, I, 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 I would love to be able to give more time to the Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation Proclamation, and so forth, all right? But certainly, what frees the slaves? Does the Gettysburg Address free the slaves? No. Does the Emancipation Proclamation free the slaves? No. no. What does? The 13th, the 13th Amendment. Amendment to the Constitution does, all right? So this is where we start to try to jump ahead a little bit into these 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, all right? So our plans for Reconstruction, Lincoln versus Johnson versus Congress. As you prepare, go through all the plans. With Lincoln, what was it? 10% plan, right? 10% of the state's population declare a loyalty oath, right? Former Confederate officials, all sorts of things. Extremely lenient. He wants to preserve the Union. The more harsh the terms are, the more bitterness is going to be deep-rooted. And so that's not going to contribute to the restoration of the Union. When we look at Johnson, right? Lincoln's assassination, right? on April 14th, right? he dies on the 15th, survives overnight, right? barely, right? assassinated on the 14th, dies on the 15th, now usher in Andrew Johnson. And restoration, and he still wants to take some of the same lenient policies as Lincoln did. But then enter Congress, they throw out the Wade Davis bill. Bring in these radical Republicans, led by who? Senator Thaddeus Stevens. Stevens. What do they want to do? These radical Republicans want to do what? They want to um, free the slaves, they have rights for the slaves. Absolutely. And they want to crush the South. Forget this leniency stuff. Look what you put us through for the last four years. And so make sure you understand the, compl uh, the, the complexities of the, the, the different Reconstruction plans. Then you've got military occupation of the South and the military districts. And only upon what? Did we get to this? Wow. 
Wow, that word again. Compromise. And another compromise. So we got us in the problem in the first place, and now we're going to compromise our way out of reconstruction. We'll do a backroom deal over cigars and brandy, all right? And put who in the White House in 1877? Robert Hayes. Hayes, right? Okay. Providing, providing reconstruction efforts led by the end in the South, okay? We'll control it. Let's shift gears there. The Civil War Amendments, 13, 14, and 15. One thing to note about constitutional amendments. Transformation takes place when you see them passed in bundles. What was the first bundle of constitutional amendments? Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights, well done. First 10. We have 27 amendments to our Constitution. 10 of them were passed by themselves, right, with the Bill of Rights. Then you got 11, 12. Then you've got 13, 14, 15. 13 is what? Abolish of slavery, all right. Fourteen? All persons born and naturalized, all right. Fifteen? Universal male suffrage. Universal male suffrage. Make a connection. Boy, does this put a real wrench in the operation of women's rights advocates for suffrage. Free black slaves are getting the right to vote between before free white women. All right. That was a little bit of an issue there, all right. So there you go with some progressive social history there. So 13, 14, 15. Then what do you have? What comes next? What's the next big bundle? You don't have another constitutional amendment, Mr. Nash, 1913? 16? All right? So you go, all right, 1860s, and you have a whole time period. Gilded Age, I know you love that. And the Progressive Era, all right? And then you get 16 is what? Direct election of senators. Income tax. I, I see it twice a month. <laughs> Income tax. Direct election of senators, 18? Prohibition. Prohibition, 19? Prohibition. Prohibition. Suffrage, very good, well done. So note constitutional amendments, right? Many times passed in these bundles, right? You always get so bundles, excited for that right? one. Right? Particularly with the progressive era, and obviously for our purposes today. Black codes. Black codes. Ushered in after the Civil War. Also note here the formation of the Ku Klux Klan. Founded by what? Those Confederate officers? white outfits with the hat and the, and the drape, right, to resemble ghosts of the Civil War past, to intimidate who? Yeah, you want to exercise that right? Okay. Go ahead. You try to exercise that right. So we usher in these black codes, which were what? What were these black codes? What were these local black codes? Designed to do what? Yeah, designed to put obstacles in the way uh, for African Americans, blacks, free blacks, to exercise their recently won political and economic freedoms. And they were clever about it, right? They were clever about it. As you move ahead, as you move ahead, poll taxes, literacy tests, oh, we're not denying them based upon their skin color. We're denying them because they can't pass this test. Look at how they work the system, right? So these black codes are going to be kind of like the precursor and planting the seeds to what's going to blossom into Jim Crow and segregation laws to form obstacles, to put obstacles in the way of those trying to exercise. Throw sharecropping in there, throw tenant farming in there as well. Answer the question, what do you do with four million emancipated slaves? You tell me, because I don't have an answer. They didn't have an answer. They themselves didn't have an answer. What do they know best? Agriculture. What do they know best? Farming. I could work hard. I could sweat out in the field. So, here you have that tenant farming. Oh, yeah, work this land as a freeman, but then you have to obviously what? You have to borrow money to get the tools, all right? You're going to have to give me a percentage of the crop back so I can sell it. It's like, it's almost like, wow, I've seen this before. It's deja vu, but I'm not a slave. I'm actually working this land as a freeman. Okay? Uh, illiterate, can't read, can't write, many of them. So, what do you do with that? And so therefore, certainly pay attention to black codes, segregation policies, Jim Crow acts, right, that are going to make it ever more difficult for freed slaves, emancipated slaves, free blacks, all right, to participate in Southern society. With the Compromise of 1877, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude right, over the next seven, eight minutes with this. You have this birth of what's called the New South. Okay? A New South that the South wants to make look like the Old South. But they know they can't do it like they had it in the years leading up to the Civil War. 
So they're going to structure Southern society right, in this new South and what it's going to look like. So as we had the presidential election right, of 1876, for the purposes, why don't I just pull up the 270 to win site? Right. Yeah, 270 to win.com, for those of you that just walked in, the website that I've used in the past gives you a lot of great election uh, data. Here we go. We're going to click up uh, the historical elections timeline. I'm sure Mr. Nash and Ms. Quinn have uh, kind of addressed a lot of these transformative presidencies. <coughs> Where I need some help here. I can't see the numbers. Really. Here is the uh, 18. Uh, right there. there we go. All right. So here's 1876. All right, here's 1876. Hayes Tilden. Uh, there's going to be disputed results, all right? There's going to be disputed results. Uh, let's see, we have the actual. There it is, all right? 185 to 184, all right? 185 to 184, uh, one of those elections, all right, that I'm sure Mr. Nash has told you about, in which the popular vote candidate loses, all right? Loses. Uh, the argument was made to this, all right? As Republicans were continuing to control, uh, reconstruction efforts in the South, all right? Democrats want them to leave, all right? And so with the disputed election results, I believe Oregon was one of the states, I think it was Louisiana, all right? Maybe Florida as well. There was disputed election results, all right? Typically disputed elections, all right, are determined in the House of Representatives, the House of Representatives. Rather, all right, an agreement is reached Democrats give up the White House that was for the taking in response that radical reconstruction efforts would end and military reconstruction would end in the Deep South. And this is how we get a Hayes presidency. So how we got ourselves into this problem in the first place with slavery being, uh, uh, who's the author? Founding Brothers. Ellis, Joseph Ellis, all right? Uh, kind of like the ghost at the banquet, he calls it. You know, the elephant in the room. Right? Everybody knows that it's there, but you don't talk about it. They compromise their way into the whole slavery dispute and slavery issue. It takes a war for 11 states to break away, for 600,000 to die, for a president to be assassinated. To get us to the point where we just simply comprom compromise our way and what's the connection that we can make? All right, moving forward. What results as, go ahead, if this were like an essay. We gave you the pre, what came before. Here's the during. What's going to come after? Can you build out three or four decades in this time period? The turn of the uh, 18th and 19th century, or 19th and 20th centuries, excuse me? What can you say? Well, it's a continuation of the chronological sense, at least, the civil rights movement. Okay, throw your Supreme Court cases in there, right? Throw Plessy in there. Separate but equal, doctor. What else? Build out four decades or so. What's coming after? Um, we do another four decades. We get to the uh, 1960s civil rights movement. That may be a stretch, you know, for your readers. Like, okay, they jumped, you know, 80 years. That's all right. Uh, but definitely, right? You are definitely planting seeds, right? And this is precursor, right? This is precursor. What else? You have the forgettable presidents. Ah, oh, you got the forgettable presidents. Absolutely. All right. What else? What else are we going through after this? Then we can tie back to this somehow. You have segregated armies until Truman and the Vietnam War. Vietnam? Korea. Korea. There you go. Well done. Well done. Right. So be able to make the connections. All right. Be able to make the connections. With the five minutes that remain, are there any topics that you want me to go on a little bit? Did, did we want to go emancipation? What exactly did the Emancipation Proclamation kind of spell out? <clears throat> Anything from the 1850s that we need to review, whether it's um, Underground Railroad, whether it's uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, whether it's Dred Scott, I'll try to maybe, go ahead. Can you just like name some causes of the Civil War? Name some? Sure, let's, let's do that. That's a great question, all right? Immediately, right, your eye is drawn to slavery. I think that's, that's the answer. I mean, all oh, states' rights, all right? States' rights. Some people throw out the states' rights argument. Keep in mind, this is a very growing movement, all right? Contract, compact theories, and so forth of government. States' rights, slavery, 
um, recognition of a leader in Lincoln who's going to drastically transform our way of life if he has his way. But remember, Lincoln at first was not this passionate abolitionist. Sure, he questioned and, and, and disputed slavery on the grounds of morality, but he wasn't going to go through the South and abolish slavery immediately. He said that. I have no intentions. Again, I'm butchering this. It's not verbatim. You know, of influencing or affecting slavery where it currently exists. However, moving west, his sights were set on moving west. And I'm sure most likely in the process, it would return back to all right, addressing it in the South. What else? So that's a great question. States' rights, states' rights advocates, um, slavery. I mean, slavery is the big issue, all right? We can't, did it take a war? It did. It took a war. Go ahead. Tariffs, all right? Keep in mind, this is a great, do you need this still or no? Can I take this out now? Okay. I'm just filming. It's all yours. One of the things that I teach, uh, and hopefully it comes up so that you guys can see it. You know, here's uh, American society, all right? Call it unified, all right? Call it unified at the time. At some point, and it, you, the, the point about the tariff, right? We start to diverge, right? And we start to form almost like this identity crisis. Like, like who are we? We've got states that are free, states that are slave. We've got industry in the north, and commerce, and finance, and banking, and shipping. And we've got slavery in the south, and cotton, and agriculture, and tobacco, and indigo. All this stuff going on. So at some point, you start to have divergent social, political, and economic points of view. And that's established, right? ironically enough, error of good feelings. Does the American system pass Congress? Henry Clay's little plan? to unify north and south with roads, bridges, canals, and turnpikes, and tariffs, and things like that. Some elements pass, but they see, wait a minute, we in the south are not going to pay for, pay for roads and canals in the north. That's not going to happen. If they want a road or a canal in their state, their state should pay for it. We're not going to use federal tax dollars, all right? We're not going to pay for that. So I think if you look, 1820s, all right? 1820s. Look at the election of, um, you start to see the sectional divide in presidential elections. Um, 24, uh, corrupt bargain. 28, clearly, right? Quincy Adams gets New England, a couple of New England, and it's all Jackson the rest of the way. So you start to see, and I'm telling you, start to recognize those presidential elections <coughs> and the sectional divide. So that's how I would answer that question. <coughs> what caused the Civil War? You have, that, you have a word in antebellum that describes a time period of decades leading up to the U.S. Civil War. They gave it its own word, for goodness sake. It's not, oh, these are the decades leading up to the Civil War. No, this is, the, this is antebellum America. They gave it a word. So I like this. All right? I like this. And you know who said it? John C. Calhoun. In the 1820s, he already recognized this. Remember, he was the vice president of Jackson, South Carolina Exposition and Protest, all right? Blasting, all right? tariff laws and things of that nature. Anything else? You guys have been a great audience. You guys have been a great audience. Uh, so what was Johnson's view? Did he also agree with the 10%? He did. Well, he, was, he, he wanted to continue the leniency policies of, uh, of Lincoln. And it's kind of like many presidents, right? Uh, Lyndon Johnson, what did he do? Right? He saw Kennedy's vision, and he wanted to certainly live that out in the remaining two years of what would have been, right? John F. Kennedy's presidency. You know, so yes, Johnson, but here's the thing. With Johnson, he's going to have to go, all right, with a midterm election, with a midterm election in which Congress drastically changes, and you pull in those Republicans that want to drastically alter, all right, reconstruction efforts and not be so lenient. All right? No, that's okay. I know you guys have to come in. I know you guys have to come in. All right? All right, I tell you what. Do you have any other personal, one, one more? I'm sorry. Sure. In the election of 1860, besides Lincoln, Douglas, Breckinridge, and uh, John C. Bell. Breckinridge is a Southern Democrat, all for slavery. Reinforce slavery where it is and let it expand. Douglas, popular sovereignty. Let the people out in the Western territories decide what to do with slavery. Lincoln's the free soiler, all right? No slavery, no free, no popular sovereignty, all right? It's going to be free soil. And John C. Bell, what's interesting about John C. Bell 
All right? I think he actually wins more electoral votes than Stephen Douglas. He's all about just restoration of the union. I don't care what it is. <coughs> yes, slavery, no slavery. I want to preserve the union. And whatever the Constitution is saying about slavery, all right, that's what I'm going to reinforce. That's what I'm going to That's another thing to mention in the 1850s. All these parties popping up, popping up, popping up. Whigs, right? Whigs are the core of the Republican Party. Become free soilers, Republicans, right? Southern Democrats, break away from Northern Democrats, right? Because here they're championing Stephen Douglas is talking free soil. That's the potential that it can become slave or free. We don't want to risk flip a coin on free or slave. We want slave. Southern Democrats break away. Any other? Any others? All right. Okay. Was Johnson as equally unpopular with the South as Lincoln was? Hmm. Good question. Is Johnson as equally, uh, because his plans in the, in the early are going to mirror those of Lincoln, I would say yes, because he does believe in, in franchise. He does believe in extending, right? But again, his is also going to be restoration. Notice the difference of the words. Reconstruction, Johnson throws out this word restoration, right? Uh, also research the Wade Davis bill. That's the more aggressive thing about the 50% loyalty oath. Lincoln wanted 10%. Wade Davis bill, 50% loyalty. All right, I got two more classes to teach over at the Grays Academy. All right, so